This is all incidental while I'm orbiting. Okay, head is up. All right. So if you kind of shoot up ahead to the end of your tether, well, that'll bring us to the peak, and then we can start heading to waypoint six. All right, do that. We are going to be kind of going down slope a little bit for that, though. All right. Yeah, so, so it'll be down slope to the, the deepest part, then back up slope. Right. And Chris, if it really looks interesting when we get to waypoint six, I may want to turn down the ravine again before we start climbing up. So what, like? To the left, this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. way? All yeah. right. Yeah, we can do that. Um, uh, okay. Are we, where, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. We're, we're high up for an orbit? No, no, no. I think you're high up, so you don't bump the back end. Oh, starting to climb yeah. down. Yeah. Oh, we're starting to climb down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think this will be nominal, uh, Dan? For what? What's that? Will this be a nominal height as we go down the slope? Hard to say. I can turn around and go backwards, but no, yeah, no, no. I don't like think there's any reason. Uh, I'll, I'll let I'll let other people decide, but I'll stop photogrammetry if if that's the case, just for yeah, going I think, down. I think from our perspective, we're more interested to see what's happening when we get to the bottom. Okay, I'm gonna stop photogrammetry. What's our uh, bearing to the bottom, Chris? Yeah, uh, one uh, one four zero. So Dan, from from my yeah, perspective, gonna, is the ship stopped here? The ship is stopped here. I'm gonna. Uh, I think I'm at the top here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a minute to uh, do some. I'm below to do this, uh, but Bob will kill me if I don't. Some ground fault uh, troubleshooting. We have a ground fault that's been steadily getting worse here, and it's getting closer to uh, concerning here. Is it? This, uh, this is the peak. Come up the pier. This appears to be the this peak. The peak. The peak. And there's the guardian fish guarding the peak. <laughs> Who can identify that fish? Or is that not a fish? That's a that's a sponge. It's the guardian sponge. I was really looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a fish. The trained geologist eye, you know. I see a sponge sideways, and it looks like a fish. Pretty much the same shape. Uh, video, I'm going to just cycle some cameras here to, uh, I really, it's going to, don't panic, it's me uh, turning things off, looking for likely a ghost. Sounds good, thanks for the heads up. Not my cameras. Why is DSC Ethernet B on? Why is Tempro on? A viewer says it's a spongy rockfish. <laughs> there we go. Now there's a fish. Good news is it's not the DVL. Have this a few other likely suspects here, and Oh, 
about the sonar or the USBO. What else? What else? Checked all the camera. I didn't check the HD camera. It's worth checking. Triclops? No, it can't be that. Triclops is uh, powered by one cent. Oh, all right. You're good. Whew. Not the HD camera. None of those, none of the cameras, none of our critical sensors. I really don't want to turn off the uh, octans. So. Yeah. Oh, there's one other one that is often gets this. Uh, sorry, the O2 sensor. Okay, I've lost interest in the uh, ground fault hunting. Uh, no more ground fault hunting. Okay. My uh, my general. Let's start moving down then. Roger. Roger, Roger. What is a what is an electrician's favorite I, band? I had a nickel for every time I spent hunting for a 24 volt ground fault. I just spent uh, probably five hundred dollars worth of ship time looking for a <laughs> <laughs> ground fault on a ten dollar cable. All right, one four zero. One four zero. Sorry, uh, left turn. From from I'm my put perspective. The ship in, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you can bridge, proceed bridge at all haste. Zero, one four zero. Uh, Larry. I won't do any photogrammetry on the way down. Okay, it, I'm, well, I'm not from a photogrammetric perspective, but from uh, other objectives, I'm hoping that things will get interesting in here, but Roger. it may not be. Yep. But, but when we're done looking up there, we'll be climbing up to the Roger. next peak, which is even higher, and that, that's where it may get interesting for you again. Roger. Jonathan, what is an electrician's favorite band? Yeah, I was going to just... ACDC? I knew it. I knew you were going to say Come that. On. And I was just hoping... fruit. I know. That's why I was hoping it was something else. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty steep. back up underneath you. Uh, no. Nope. So how we do this going down the hill, we got to do it opposite. So we need Atalanta in the deeper, deeper water. Uh, well, you'll be out. Uh, you'll be out to the uh, southeast of me. Or I'll be under you. So I'll either be under you or to the uh, northwest of you. And that way you don't have to worry about, you know, stuff in Atalanta and the rocks. Yep, you can come up a bit there. So I'll wait for you to get out in the deeper water and then I'll follow you down. And uh, that way you can get in the deeper water and kind of come low or lower. And you can uh, look down and look at Herc, and then we come back down the hill and uh, keep everybody happy. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, if you go uh, counterclockwise, that would be probably good. So I might come backwards, or I might zigzag, depending on how what the how steep it is. If it's really steep, I'll turn around and look at it.
Yeah, you're going to want to come all the way around and look uh, northwestish. Um, Taylor Ann, can you record? I just made a white balance adjustment to. Sorry, I missed that. I just made a white balance adjustment to okay. 51K and 50. tint plus 25. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, no problem. Him, uh, Ooh, thank you. Oh, yeah. More muffins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Skinner ring, ki ding, ki ding, skinner ring, ki do. That's a really cool looking Jonathan with tri tops. Mm -hmm. Trying to make it better. More so better. We're backing down. Is that the idea? Okay. All right. I'm gonna keep the ship moves coming. Bridge, bridge nav. Four zero one four zero. Yeah, we're going to the uh, Should be able to turn to the uh, northwest now. No. Right, that's much better. Makes my life a little happier. Jonathan singing softly in the background is Oops, just the song. perfect little spooky Delta's soundtrack. Delta's not written in stone, it depends on <laughs> It's actually terrifying. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm singing, I'm singing skinamarinky dinky dink skim. I love you. <laughs> but but in this little hushed voice, uh, it's perfectly right, terrifying. Your perfectly left creepy. a little more, so... It's going to be 300-ish. Ooh, I'm seeing another answer in our <laughs> chat for what's the electrician's favorite uh -huh. band. Are you sure it's not ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra? I think Manel would have liked that answer better. I would have. I like that answer. Good job. Although I will say, I don't know the Electric Light Orchestra, and I do know ACDC. Oh, this is a good question. What would be your dream creature to see on a dive? That's a great question. You want to go around and answer it? I'm very partial to river otters myself. <laughs> 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 on a deep sea dive? That, well, that, that would be an occasion. That it? would be an occasion. Yeah. yeah. That rock was a 
tail stopper. <laughs> <laughs> See it? In the yeah. Half camera. Ali, what, what about you? Your dream creature to see on a dive? Me? Yeah. Oh, um, I want to see a Chonicox. Ooh. A what? Well, we saw, like, that's your moose I'm fish. Not, is it? Yeah, it's closely they're related. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, gonna be but, but that's here, they're, so. they're very yeah. closely related. Let me they're look both anglerfish. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're anglerfish. Oh, wow. Goose. I didn't know that. And it is not a moose fish. It's a moose fish. It's and okay. It's a stomp. Oh, perpetuating right. the misinformation You're <laughs> that I started. Right. It's a it's a goosefish or a monkfish. It is not the moosefish is a name that we oh, affectionately yeah. came up with when Ali mistakenly called it a moosefish. Yes, because but I combined monk and goose. I'll just fly towards so we you, are saying so. that only well, we've all adopted it because I think we all like the name. <laughs> there we go. There but uh, the technical term is monkfish or goosefish. So just so you know for further reference. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> for me, well, we I think uh, honestly I would just like you. to see like a really highly populated biodiverse area. Oh. I think right now that's that's kind of the dream. That's a good answer. Yeah, yeah I'd take that. I just want to see one Kraken. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> just the one. We're definitely going to have yeah. a Kraken in the video game. Ooh. Choose your own choose your own adventure. Bridge, bridge. I would love a Kraken. Four, zero, one, four, trying here. trying the the goal of the uh, kind of immersive experience well, stop. from the What are you googling? Well, I'm googling <laughs> moosefish. <laughs> Some really good ones. <laughs> Hopefully, the current will cooperate and I can get a little closer to you. I would love to see the giant squid. Ooh. Ooh. That would be pretty wild. What's that? Well, you would. No, go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, oh, if the current cooperates and blows the tether away, then we can get closer and you can. I can. Use on the, on the on the last. Just a little for me. Uh-oh. That, that model didn't work. See, yeah, viewers asking, is, the, is Moose the name of the monk fizz chonacom said uh, if it's following the ROV? That was an interesting one, that little non-Moose fish. That it was, we saw it two days in a row, the same guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, he was... It's the original boost. Yeah. Somewhere <laughs> in the world, there, in Canada, actually, a bunch of moose are just perking their ears up. There's just somebody like the original? That, are you sure? That there, I think somebody wrote that there actually is a moose fish, but it, it's like a river fish. It's a freshwater fish. Oh, so when we see Jonathan's river ardor, we will actually find yeah. the moose fish. <laughs> And somebody wrote in that moose fish is Aqua Squatch's pet. Uh, yeah. All right, come down, get closer to me. And uh, I'll come along this way. Maybe you can look to your right. Taylor will oh. stay behind us. Taylor Ann, on the last uh, on the last vessel I was on, I met the cinematographer who um, who filmed the Humboldt squid fight in uh, Blue Planet Two. Wow, that's really fun. Yeah, that had to be an extraordinary opportunity. Yeah. Oh yeah, apparently it was like his breakthrough moment in oh, wow. the cinematography in the nature filmmaking world. Yeah, that's extraordinary. I'll have to look that up. There's yeah. always one. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so if he's he was asking. Really Filmmaker. Sorry, well, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what would be the first thing you would say if you saw a giant squid on a dive? You can get a little closer as long as the Probably tether's a, not hit. Probably a giant gasp. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to what, what we do here when we see things we haven't seen in a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but probably much more excited. I would say that's incredible. Get it? In incredible? <laughs> incredible? Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow. <laughs> Wow. No? Oh, oh. Anyone? I'm having a reaction. Is my, is my mic on? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, it is. Oh, I heard yeah. it. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Two other bands that an electrician would like are Sparks and Wire. Ooh. Ooh. Go 
going down sideways. I like it. You get a <laughs> preview down there anyway. When you go sideways. What's that? You get a little preview down there when you go sideways. Oh, yeah. A viewer I get better in orbit data squid. if I went backwards, though, right? Yeah, you would, but if you you could, but this way you can use it to see if there's anything coming up. Uh, I got a camera behind me. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. The orbit data on this is not going to be great anyway, with the amount of turning and whatever we're doing. So do whatever you well, want. I could stop turning. <laughs> you can come down a little more, right? <laughs> Tethers. Yeah, we're good. Bridge, bridge nav, another four zero. I'm going to uh, go to the north of it just to spread the tether out there a little. I'm reaching out with a giant arm of God to see what's going <laughs> on. Let me see if I can get you a little more range. Probably not. No. That's plenty of range. Cannot. So you're side flipping sideways down there? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is to let you see better, Chris? Is it? No, this oh. is this lets Dan see what's up ahead so he doesn't yeah. run into stuff going down. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I'm, well, yeah. It, it lets us see. It right. lets the Collect uh, back row, see. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, everybody no. who's watching see something. Sure, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not complaining. I'm just. Uh, if it was uh, ver verifying the rationale, that's <laughs> Roger. If it was steeper, I would go uh, face back cliff backwards. and come down. Yeah, backwards. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's kind of a nice way. It's, it's what I do on a steep, 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 steep <laughs> ski slope. Yeah. <laughs> just slide slip, side slip. So on satellite feed three, you can see a map of this slope that we're kind of going down sideways. It scares me too when I see my... Go for nav. You can change the heading. Halfway there? Something like that, yeah. Looks like you got a little rock or something coming up. Oh, yeah. The little red dots? Yeah, well, you see that there's something kind of blocking the, the returns in the water column data. Like that big rock right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Nice. The power of sonar again. I'm not sure how you spotted that. I've spent a lot of time looking at a lot of different kinds of sonar data. <laughs> That's how. Yeah, I totally missed it. Yeah. Well, I wonder if we could roll that rock down there. <laughs> oh, there you go. Every time. Can we get an idea of the angle of this slope? Yeah. Chris I can. can tell you. Not better High than pack. I can. Let me get, sorry, let me get my appropriate tool up for that. Yeah, 
it looks like about 20 degrees 20 degrees okay yeah. It looks, like, it looks like it's flattening out too. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it looks yeah. like, yeah. Let's get this set up because the water column view will be nice. Where can I put this? Whoa. There we go. Okay, Dan, when we get to the bottom, we may choose to follow the deepest part of the ravine a little way but we'll, we'll take a look when we get there like this kind of stuff here but well not quite yeah that, that you're starting but i think we we've got let's get to the to the bottom of it bridge bridge nav four zero right. one four zero pretty close i am uh maybe 20 meters away yeah not even get to see it I'm closing in on Hercules sonar. Mm -hmm. Yep, I see. Let's see Chris's sonar flattening out. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know, maybe that's just reflection. Yeah, no, we sonar. the contours are starting to flatten out in the map, yep. so Yep. Sorry, oh, I should have waited. I should have followed those uh, little sand road there for a minute. Well, we can come back to that um, that small area, but I, I'd rather confirm that we've we've. Uh, are you uncomfortable close to the right side? No, no. I just uh, I got too far ahead of Atlanta. Oh, okay. Dragging its tether there. I'm looking. Uh, now it's kind of dancing around. So. Yeah, the Basically, USBL has been a little. That's a lame excuse. Basically, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> This is really cool. It's another uh, Ritigorgia with a, an enemy on top. And now you can see kind of why this is called the firework coral from this angle. And Chris, if we could not really aim for waypoint six, but aim for like the apex of the ravine. You see that on the... Yeah, I mean, is, is that not waypoint six? Well, waypoint six seems to be a nice flat area. I'd, I'd rather see the if you just move up to the. There you go, right? That. Yeah. yeah. You don't think this is? You don't. You don't think that's the apex? Well. Uh, I, I, I mean, it seems like it's right in the middle of these two. Yeah. Well. I, I, oh, you're I, interested in the ravine, not the top the, of the saddle. Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. I, I got gotcha. you. I'm concerned that we come to the top of the saddle, we're not going to see a flow. I understand. So maybe more like right here. Yeah, or even further. Yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah. Okay. Putting a lot of faith in these contours, but. Uh. Well, yeah. <laughs> Wait, we should have got your Drix maps in here. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know what happened there. What? Um, I'm wondering if these are actually. Uh, I don't know. I, I Rennie set this up, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think he might have. He certainly was looking for them, and I offered to give it to him, and he said he had them or could find them, so. Now we're going to make the bridge set because he got the ship all headed, pointed in this direction. <laughs> we're going to change that. Sorry, I'm below you too, right? Let me, I'll wait for you. Oh, 
bridge, bridge. Let's cancel this move and do four zero one one five. Zeus and uh, Mini Zeus should be an auto iris. Manual, it freaks out. Yeah, come, come in. That's really beautiful. This is another one of those uh, Tretro Plura. I'm adding an extra R in there. I cannot pronounce it without it. <laughs> Let's see. I'll try Tret it again. Tretop? Uh, Tretoplura. So, Tretoplura. Yeah. Tretoplura. All right. Incredible to see these um, these corals standing in this boneyard, yeah. like just surrounded. Yeah. So th this is a sponge, actually. This one right here. Whoopsies. No, you're okay. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I'm gonna give myself a couple more expeditions before I try to actually know the difference between <laughs> corals and sponges. I know I'll get there, but yeah, you got it. <laughs> But yeah, we're still seeing these fallen sponges. Yeah, I've got yeah, down five minutes. Dan, can we shut the lasers off, please? Uh, Viewers are commenting that the map looks like Minecraft. I dare one of our viewers to recreate this in Minecraft. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, Taylor and a viewer wrote in, treat o plura. Treat you know plura. that, yeah. I wonder why there's no A there. Is there? Let me check. Treat o plura. Yeah. Trick or treat o plura. Oh. That's easier to say, for yeah, sure. Are you just waiting for Atalanta? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. I have uh, 180 of opportunity. Yep. I know those opportunities you take. <laughs> I can't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. I gotta keep Free our keep nav, four our zero, one, one, zero. Happy. There's a fish. Finally, we got yeah. a fish. Oh, a shark. Mm. Yeah. What? Oh. oh my gosh. I'll see if I can herd him in the direction we're supposed to be going. Thanks, Dan. 
Um, we've got a question about the camera, but Jonathan's not here. Um, does anybody know if it's shooting in high dynamic range? In HDR, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard him mention that. Um, currently, right now, the we're, they're saving as JPEGs. I don't know oh, wow. oh, okay. if that is answering it the right way. <laughs> I'm not a camera person. Yeah. You said you're shooting in JPEGs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a shark. A what? A shark. Oh, it's a, a shark. shark. Yeah. Oh, my uh, word. Let's see. Why? Which one is it? <laughs> oh. Highlight. Potentially this shark. Yeah, Hello, of, Alaska. Like yeah, it had the same depth range and fin. What kind of shark is that? Uh, Etoma. Ooh. At Mop Teraday. We have a question online about how fast Hercules is moving. That's spectacular. Hercules typically moves uh, at the speed of the ship in Atalanta, which is about <laughs> 10 meters a minute. He, he sleeps. He sleeps all the time. Beautiful. Uh, no, we're almost uh, almost there. So just from I a just, quick. So this is one of my modes while we're kind of boring. So I get out, put as much tether in the bank as I can while I'm waiting for Atalanta, and then I can like, look at some cool geology or beautiful biology while I'm waiting for Atalanta. I zoom across the boring stuff. And <laughs> Practice my pirouettes on the beautiful stuff. Bonk. Bonk. <laughs> What's the lighting on Zeus? Uh, we're looking downhill. There's another dead, dead sponge. Another fossil. Yeah. So if I tried to pick that up, would it just completely shatter, or is it I'm hard? Having the foggiest idea. Do you have any idea if he tried to pick it up, it would would it shatter? Yeah, if you squeeze it too hard, it would probably crack. But I think you would be able to pick it up and carry it for a, a while. Air Force video. Got a few seconds here. Yeah, yeah. copy. Two. Two. Yeah. That's good. Thanks. Yeah, and, th and there was one that just left it. Yeah. It's got things growing on it. If you look lower left, there's a, should be another couple. You know, there's one there, and then another piece. Oh. I don't know, maybe that's... Oh, yeah. even older, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Can I pick one up? Sure, I can pick, pick one up. Well, so look. We're just seeing how... Yeah, Bob's saying, suggesting maybe the last thing we do, we leave the bot before we leave the bottom is grab one and see if we can... Hold it on the way up. I could probably put a piece of it in the box. He said put a, he could put a piece of it in the box. He could probably put a piece of it in the box. <laughs> Selfish. He wants the whole thing. <laughs> All or nothing, eh? Yeah. Roger. <laughs> okay, you can go away. Yeah. Copy. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. We'll move on. As soon as you're, as soon as you're ready. But we have to be up at 8 p.m. So we'll leave at uh, about uh, 6. So we still have uh, two hours. Yeah, two hours plus. Eight firm. So just to 
provide some context for everyone in the room on that HDR question. Um, HDR stands for high dynamic range, which we know, um, and it's the range of light and dark tones in your photos. I have consulted Professor yeah, Google so, on so this. Yeah, so Dan, if you can, <laughs> tend any way, it would be, yeah, it would be to the left. So my guess the right. is there's, right there, they're probably left. recording in HDR, get, especially the because we're, the ship, doing, uh, we're doing right a lot of raw data. Yeah, so from what I know okay. about photography in He's HDR is like it. you Sing combine it. three exposures of the same image, you know, something that's like in the middle and then under and overexposed and um, then you basically pick out each you pixel. You want to be right there where the bow of the ship is now? Uh, I'd like to be out. even further in, the, further in the valley if I could. A little so bit. Yeah, yeah, so it's probable that even because further of the resolution is, uh, moving us that way there. on these yep. cameras and um, just doing the photogrammetry, it, it is probable that we're doing HDR, but I <laughs> yeah, this can is, neither uh, confirm nor deny. This is yeah. Jonathan in uh, the lounge. Oh, and, um, oh Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, you absolutely hit the nail on the head on uh, the technicals behind the HDR. And in this instance, we're actually not recording in HDR. Um, for this uh, program, this type in particular, where we've actually lowered, um, I'm sorry, two dives ago, we were recording in raw format. Um, Say again, Bridge? That has about 13 uh, stops of dynamic range, which is uh, the capacity of the camera to see both highlights and Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Uh, but for this we'll zoom in, jellyfish, find out what um, it is. I can't resist. We're recording as a JPEG. Because a benthicodon jelly. A what? A benthicodon. Sorry a to cut you off, Jonathan. Oh, benthicodon no, jelly. Uh, this, we're recording JPEGs, because um, it's in this instance, the JPEGs allow us to uh, execute the, the real purpose of the next couple of dives for photogrammetry, which is to demonstrate that we can do this in near real time. Jelly. Mm -hmm. So that's what our data team is doing right now, is we're pulling the JPEGs off of the cameras and um, processing them. Uh, we're about an hour and a half behind the actual observations of the dive now. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Cool. Manel missed a little bit of that answer because she's a little busy, but thanks. So Chris, if even you, if you can bring the ship even a little further into that valley, that would be good. Yeah. We've got somebody who's um, blind watching right Bridge, now or, or now. listening Cancel in right now. Um, we would appreciate zero, some uh, zero, nine, description zero. of what we're seeing. Uh, we're looking at some basalt rocks. Kind of just going along, mapping, getting a video should, should, should be. for yep. 3D rendering. Trap on an old sponge. Yeah, I'll have to get the rest of that answer from Jonathan at another time. Come, yeah. <laughs> uh, come down five for me. Uh, he said four. that we were collecting HDR images, but we haven't been. On this dive, right? Yeah. Like, cool. uh, I think it was a couple of days ago that we were doing HDR. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So I was right, just not the right day. It's totally fine. Also, oh, once again, Ali, great job on that teamwork. <laughs> Those Norbit uh, beams are uh, picking up the other side there. The other side of the... Okay. I don't think it's set to that range. Let me see. Uh, no. No. Oh, it's just uh, scatter, I see, and yeah. Herc sonar? Yeah. <gasps> oh, oh, excuse me. Mm, maybe. Uh, Norbit doesn't necessarily do well when things are that oblique. Oh, yeah. So we could look at the, let's look at the water column. 
it looks like maybe there's some bright return here, and it does kind of flatten out. Maybe that's what you're picking out. Yeah. That little jog in the bathymetry out that way. Yeah, because if I come up, it's still uh, 10, 20, 30 meters away before it. Yeah. 30 meters to go. And Chris, if we can continue moving down that valley, that would be good. Okay. Will do. Is coming into it. Uh, yeah, a little bit, probably more over. I, guess, I don't know. I, I don't think the resolution is enough. So, it no. seems like you're pretty much in the in the base here. Yeah, maybe a little more. You could go. But. <laughs> I'm calling that one the bamboo curly fry. <laughs> <laughs> or spectacles. A couple of squat mops. Looks like spectacles from over here. Yeah, it does look like spectacles. Coming, still slowly coming down, so. No, I said I'm still, I'm still slowly coming down. I think Larry's hoping for the mother load of flows here in the bottom. Yeah, but I think we got to get a little further down the valley. To I think so, yeah. yeah. Further down the valley, like to the north, you mean? To the yeah, to the north uh, east a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. I'll wait. I'll wait for you here. Uh, okay. This is uh, signing off and handing you over to Daniela. Keen. Keen. They're five. They're five minutes early. Watch this. All the all the 4 p.m. people are keen. They're in here five minutes early. So uh, if you're happy, Larry, we'll uh, hand it over to him. Just just copy that, Larry? No, I didn't. Uh, the 4 p.m. shift seems to be pretty keen. They're here five minutes early, so I'm going to hand it over to him. Okay, sounds okay, good. good just, yeah. And who's taking over from you? Is it uh, Simon's going to take Simon? over. It'll be uh, Simon and uh, Mike. On, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. And, yeah. They're, they're going to. SPL check one, two, check, check. Sounds good. Yep. Copy that. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. This is Daniela Griffey, your science communication fellow for the 4 to 8 watch. Everyone's kind of switching on over right now, so bear with us for a little bit as we wait to get everyone situated, and then we'll do a new round of introductions for you. So Dan, have you been, I've been super busy. I've been doing the Instagram takeover. So normally I really watch in the lounge and I keep track of what we're doing and what we've seen on it. But I have been staring at Instagram all day today, filming videos. You guys should go check it out because I spent a lot of time doing it today. Go watch our right, my Instagram do, uh, takeover. But Dan, can you give me a little recap of how the zero dive's five. been going so far today? Zero one five. No, I can't hear you. There we go. There you are. All right. It's been a it's been an interesting dive. So we dove right down, and uh, when we landed, we came right upon you know um, a flow of manganese nodules and picked up a sample. I'm and excited then to see that. Started to continue up the slope, uh, following uh, the valley, and seeing a number of coral on the sides. Um, some Venus flytrap anemones, everyone likes those. Um, basket stars, a bunch of sponges as we went up through. I think they just saw a shark. I saw that in those um, chat messages people were talking about the shark. I'm, kinda, I'm pretty sad I missed that. Do we know what kind of shark it was? I do not. Oh, Zach, do you have an idea of what kind of shark it was? Uh, I didn't see a shark. They saw one earlier? They saw one earlier. Oh, I was I know. watching the wrong screen. I know. I missed it too. So we'll mm. have to go look at our highlights later on and see what kind of shark it was. Oh, it was up in the Atlanta cam? Nice. That's a first for this trip. Yeah. yeah. We're looking maybe, for that. Maybe we'll get one for our watch here. Fingers crossed. So where are we now, Dan? So right now we are at, oh, wow. How Let's about see. now? We're at 13, uh, 1,389 okay, uh, meters deep. We are right in between two sort of sea mounds. We're up, but you know, there's a little saddle and it goes back down and comes comes back up. So we're kind of exploring down the valley to see what, you know, what's living, what's not, what type of geology is down there. 
and then we'll go down for a while and we'll turn um, about a half hour we'll turn up and uh, continue up to the top all right very cool all right is everyone ready for a round of introductions I'll start us off. My name is Daniela Gerfay. I'm the Science Communication Fellow for the 4 to 8 Watch. Um, when I'm not on Nautilus, my job is a high school teacher. I teach marine science and AP environmental science at Radford High School, which is located on the island of Oahu, right next to Pearl Harbor. So I have a lot of military students as well as a lot of local students. We have a really big diversity at my school. It makes it a lot of fun. Prior to becoming a teacher, I worked as a marine biologist for 10 years. I did some work in Alaska, fisheries work, and then I also did some uh, consulting work over in East Timor and Australia. So um, this has been great to be able to get back out in the field, feel like I'm using my marine biology degree again, and then also just give this experience, take it home to my students and all the opportunities that uh, this fellowship has offered me. So I feel really grateful to Ocean Exploration Trust for giving me this opportunity. All right, Dan, would you like to go next? Sure, I am uh, Dan Dietz. Uh, I am here as the co-watch lead. Um, I guess my job here is to look over and make sure that we're following the dive plan and move it along and finding new and good things to explore. And this dive has been pretty great at that. Um, in my day job, I am a program officer for the Office of Naval Research, so I look for new technologies for undersea to essentially understand the basic science, you know, for geology to meteorology to oceanographic um, sensing and also in applications and taking making sensors that sense the environment. Thank you, Dan. Zach, next on over to you. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. I'm over here in the uh, data corner. I'll be keeping track of everything we see today and keeping all the notes so we can refer back later. Uh, when I'm not up here on this cruise, I'm down with the data team in the lab, building the models that um, coming out of these, these current um, dives we're on. Uh, we already built a couple from this one here today, so uh, it's been an, um, a, it has been enjoy enjoyable uh, doing so. Uh, we've got lots more models to build, so it's exciting. Um, yeah, when I'm not here, I am currently a graduate student. I'll be finishing up here soon over at UH Hilo, um, where I focus my work on using remote camera systems for um, underwater observations in kind of the near shore reef environment. Thank you, Zach. Dave, on over to you at Video. Hi, David Video here. Um, let's see, I'm uh, the video guy on the 4 to 12. I'm uh, got all the cameras and the recorders going on in front of me. Uh, zoom in when uh, requested and uh, fix things when they break. Thank you, Dave. Front row, are you guys good to, for introductions as well? Sure. This is Renato Kane sitting in the navigation seat. Oh, Simon, I can't hear you on SPL. My apologies, I'll push the button. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, I'm Simon, I'm the ROV pilot for this uh, next four hours. Um, 17 years of ROV experience, but it's my first trip on Nautilus. So, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Ballard. I'm one of the lead scientists on the expedition, and I'm the president of the Ocean Exploration Trust that owns and operates the Nautilus, and I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Oceanography, University of Rhode Island. I'm Mike uh, Burns, and I am the co-pilot for Simon, uh, piloting Atalanta, and uh, also the deck chief on board. So for um, for Bob and, and Dan, um, right now we are kind of still continuing a little bit down, uh, down slope, down this valley here. Um, about time to make another ship move if you'd like me to continue on down. Um, let me know uh, how far you'd like to go. Uh, I'd say can keep continuing down. Um, we can go a little bit side to side if you want to explore a little more as we continue down. Roger. But, but in this general direction, yeah. Okay, I'll keep going uh, down here until, uh, until either the slopes are stu too steep to continue down or we'll... Uh, or you'd like to continue on up. Next okay, bit. sounds good. Sure. Thank you. Uh, pilots, that'll be zero one zero bearing. 
So one of our viewers that is watching is kind of Zero visually one. impaired. So I kind of wanted to give an overview. I'll try my best. I'm not very artistic at the description of what we're looking at. But right now we're looking at this slope. Um, it looks like a pretty sandy bottom covered in some loose rocks, potentially manganese nodules. Anyone know if they are not manganese nodules? Well, they're probably, yes, nodules that uh, where we've sampled them in the past are coated from manganese oxide that's precipitated out of the water column. And in this case, we're heading down slope. We're right actually up near the summit at a saddle. So you'll see the, the red streaks so will eventually grow until the entire uh, valley uh, ravine that we're going down will be black. We've sampled it at two different locations and we'll be looking at those when we come to the surface to determine their rare earth content. And Dr. Ballard, would you mind sharing with our viewers at home the importance of these manganese nodules, especially with the looks of people wanting to start mining our deep sea here? Yeah, when we uh, discovered uh, high temperature uh, black smokers on the East Pacific rise in 1979, we discovered that there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, fluids coming out along the mid-ocean ridge which is uh, 70,000 kilometers long. And a certain percentage of those uh, uh, fluids that come out, when they're quenched, they precipitate out and form what are called polymetallic sulfide deposits, which the smoke is really not smoke. It's microcrystals of pyrite, yeah, calcopyrite, and anhydrite and sphalerite. A certain percentage of that material is deposited out. It's rich in, it's rich in more than rare earth. It's rich in... Uh, copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold, and it's about a certain percent of it is deposited at the site. The rest is reabsorbed into the water column and uh, then re-precipitates out in different settings. One of the settings is in, down in the abyssal plains. Uh, about 5,000 meters, you have the formation of uh, what are called manganese nodules. Uh, and then on rock surfaces like the ones we're in, uh, you get a deposit that are called uh, cobalt-rich crust uh, or manganese oxide crust, but fundamentally the same chemistries within them. And this is a, a fourth kind of deposit that we discovered just a few years ago. We're on these uh, very ancient uh, seamounts. This is, uh, we're on uh, uh, McCall Seamount, a part of the geology seamount group, and it's a pre-Cretaceous age. Uh, it's about 82 million years old, and it was formed during the mid-Cretaceous when there was a major event within the Earth called a superplume that led to the formation of thousands and thousands of volcanoes. And those volcanoes went dormant, and most of them uh, have been subducted. That ancient crust has been subducted in the various parts of the uh, ocean system at convergent zones. But here we're on a, a piece of ocean floor that has yet to be subducted, and it's carrying with us these volcanoes. It should not be uh, confused with the Hawaiian Islands, which are uh, nearby. Those are very recent phenomena. It's called a, a hot spot. We also call it a thunderhead of the mantle. There's a, a storms within the earth that are deep in the earth, and they come up and like a welder's torch as the plate passes over it. It creates islands, but these islands are just a few million years of age. So it's very different than the crust that where, where these volcanoes are sitting, which is 82 million years old. And we think that these that black streaking is the beginning of the formation of nodules similar to the ones that you have uh, in the abyssal depths. But here it's much shallower. Uh, we're at right now at, at 1,400 meters versus 5,000 meters, and then they coalesce, as I say, as they go down slope. So we're trying to understand their geologic setting. Because these flows are moving uh, very slowly, but they're still moving, you'll notice there is absolutely no benthic community. You t would typically, in abyssal depths, find uh, wormholes and lots of bioturbation and a whole community of, 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 of uh, ecosystem living inside the, 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 the sediments as well as just above it. 
in the epipenthic area. Here it's pretty uh, devoid of life. So what we're trying to determine is uh, how large these deposits are. Uh, we were out here just a, f a few weeks ago with a new s uh, mapping system that Dr. Larry Mayer, who's with us and just finished his watch, developed at the University of New Hampshire called DRIX, has a, a new sonar system, much higher frequency than the ones we have on the Nautilus. And what we did was to map this area to see if we could get a, a, a signature, an acoustic signature of these flows, which we did, uh, because when we're mapping it visually, we can't cover a lot of real estate. So what we're doing right now is ground truthing that larger map so that we can start trying to quantify the size of these deposits. So that's fundamentally what we're doing. We're building a model to give us some uh, degree of accuracy. Here, clearly not significant deposits, but as these like tributaries of a stream going down a mountain, they come together and come together till you get a very uh, dense flow. And where we started earlier today down at the base, it was all black. So we're just simply trying to better understand uh, the size and distribution of these deposits. Thank you, Bob, for that overview. Uh, so for our viewers, manganese is really important because it's a, a metal that is used in a lot of our electronics. So as our world is getting more and more electronic based, we have our cell phones. Think about how many cell phones you go. So this metal is getting harder and harder to find. So that's one of the reasons that people are starting to look towards the sea as a source for this. And um, we are still trying to figure out what that impact would be. So I, Bob, how do you think that deep sea mining would affect our deep sea here? Well, the key is to find um, you came off SPL. The key is to find deposits that are of, of size to merit mining that are in a, in a system that has no ecosystem. And that's why we're very interested in these ancient seamounts, as you can see, there's very, very little going on here. So that's the big question. There's some recent studies and simulations. If you want to go online and look at a recent uh, study done by MIT and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography where they simulated, the big issue is the resuspension of the material. Uh, we just took some samples, for example, and we found just like the study that, that their course are grained enough that they immediately fall back to the bottom. So we're still very early in understanding this new unique deposit. Uh, so we're certainly uh, feel we have to learn more and more, but it's just in the time we've been talking, you've seen these little rivulets come together and it's becoming more and more black until you finally have a, a rather substantial flow. So the key is, can we actually quantify it? It turns out that this is a surficial deposit uh, if you scrape it away, uh, you find nothing underneath it. So this is a, a sort of a river uh, going down slope and then slowly coming together. If you look in the in uh, arid areas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and you see sediments coming off uh, of a mountain range and as they coalesce into larger and larger flows and finally flow out into what's called an alluvial deposit, uh, that's fundamentally what we're looking at. Even though we're underwater, gravity is gravity. It moves fairly slowly, but because it's constantly moving, it's a hard place to set up shop and live. Um, in addition to that, if the, uh, Dr. Ballard, I'd just like to add, I was in the um, Clarion Clipperton zone for two trips. I'm the uh, Maersk launcher working for the metals company doing the um, surveys and everything else for the polymetallic nodules that uh, he was talking about on the abyssal plane. Uh, also part of the um, All Seas venture to, um, I was on the initial sea trials for the first collector that actually went down earlier last year and managed to successfully get nodules from the seabed. But as you compare this terrain to the one uh, in oh. the Clariton Clipperton, it's, <laughs> Absolutely, it's yeah, full of benthic activity. This is devoid of it. So, and more importantly, it's much shallower. So if I were to bet on any that would be one that could be done in a at least evasive way, it would be what we now are just discovering on these higher uh, seamounts that are very old. 
when you actually get onto the lava themselves because the uh, deposits are like pouring molasses onto the terrain. You, you eventually fill up all of the niches for the smaller animals and you can't have a food chain unless you have the little guys at the base of the food chain. So, like I say, this is all fairly recent. We only discovered this particular kind of deposit uh, just two years ago. So we're very early in understanding that. I might also add that in addition to what we're doing here in the science, we're really, this primary purpose of this expedition is we're just sort of taking advantage of our presence here, but we have a very new uh, imaging, a series of imaging camera systems uh, sponsored by the Office of Naval Research. Uh, I've uh, been working with the Office of Naval Research for 52 years. I have the longest active grant, and they've always been the organization I could count on to help develop the new exploratory technology. Uh, it was the Office of Naval Research that funded the development of the submersible Alvin in the 60s. They then funded us to develop the Argo Jason system as we moved away from using humans to go down to the bottom of the ocean uh, to then the funding of this particular uh, uh, ship uh, technologies where we use telepresence so that we can literally not only not be down below, a, a lot of the people when we're operating the Nautilus that we call doctors on call, they're not even on the ship. And, and now we're starting to make the move to where we will have ships that won't have anyone on them. If you uh, look at uh, the back of the ship, you can't see right now, uh, we have a new uh, handling system that we use called DRIX, where we have a, an autonomous surface vessel, and that kind of technology will eventually be where you have no humans at sea. I feel like that scenario of no humans at sea, it's really cool, but also kind of makes me sad. I love being here feeling like, you know, you're part of the science. Whereas, well, with the immersive technology yeah. that we're going to have, you're going to think you're here. Yeah, that is true. Like, the, I'm really excited for when we get the VR headset going and you feel like you are in the ocean right along with Hercules. So yeah, the key th right now, if you look on, uh, I don't know if you're getting an image of our command center. Maybe you could put one up on the satellite to show you where we are right now in our control center. I mean, it's all about it. Maybe do the other one, the quad, uh, where they're looking at the screen. And you can see monitors after monitors. I don't know, maybe we have 40 or so monitors in the room. And we're really going to move away from uh, monitors to where you're a fish. <laughs> so the whole idea is to get it so that you're fully immersed. Look at the increase in black as we go down slope. Just picking up more and more as we head down slope. And those are all the little, the little streamlets that are coming in from the side. We're in a, a, between two peaks in a valley. And what we're gonna do uh, pretty soon, because we're, we're sort of seeing the rapid increase in the nodules going down slope, which we've already been down uh, at the very base of it where it's all black. Uh, and we're going to then head uphill, and uh, we'll be getting into some pretty spectacular terrain as we summit. Uh, we will see, as we get into the rock terrain, we'll start seeing uh, sponges and, and, and corals, because they don't depend upon an ecosystem on the bottom, like a, a fish and other uh, epibenthic uh, uh, marine life. They're really looking to catch food, and they tend to like to be up in the tops of the uh, sea mounts where they can simply open their mouth and get fed by the currents go, going by them. So we're going to see some really neat terrain. We'll also be encountering a lot of ancient fossils of old corals and, and, and sponges. We've been seeing lots of them so far, so keep an eye out for them when we summit. Uh, but you'll really look at the, ev the sequence of dead creatures that have been uh, living here or, and dying over the last 82 million years. So it's really quite a, a rich area for exploration.
So I have a question in the chat here is asking, um, what is everyone's favorite deep sea animal that they see? So Dave, do you want to start off with you? Uh, Dumbo octopus. Dumbo octopus? Grimpetuthus. <laughs> Very nice. Dan, what's your favorite deep sea animal? Oh, well, after last night, it was the octopus. Oh, just watching, just it, watching crawl it crawl on the sand right up into the rocks and just disappearing. It's it was so good at camouflage. <laughs> Zach, what's your favorite deep sea animal? Mm, I'll be different because last time I said cephalopod and now we've seen a couple. So I'll say shark now. So we shark. get a shark on this one. Oh, so you're thinking if you ask for it, we'll yeah. get it. I like that. <laughs> Must manifest it, right? <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to go with the giant squid, and I'll try to manifest a giant squid. <laughs> it is a cephalopod, but, you know, that would be pretty cool. I don't think a Ocean Exploration Trust has seen a giant octopus yeah. or a giant squid yet. Remy, what is your favorite deep sea animal? Change it up a little bit. The deep staria jelly, which we have some highlights of, really oh. it's a spectacular creature. And Dr. Ballard, what is your favorite deep sea animal? Well, they would be the ones we found in the hydrothermal vents mm. of the Galapagos in 1977. Uh, tube worms that are uh, the largest one I've collected is over 13 feet tall. Wow. They grow in, in hedges. In fact, we when we first found them, we call them the rose garden because they're literally sticking their lung out of their tube to ingest a toxic poisonous gas called hydrogen sulfide that they pass to their gut and they've completely given their entire internal uh, space including giant clams uh, have given up all of their internal space to another uh, uh, creature uh, what we call a th a, a, an extremophile an extremophile has learned how to replicate photosynthesis in the dark so if you want to learn more about that, just look up hydrothermal vents. But if you go to nautiluslive.org, uh, which you're on right now, but if you go up to gallery, you'll see an amazing number of uh, clips, very short clips. I love the googly squid, the googly-eyed squid. Yes, that is a big, that is, big popular one. You so cannot, cute. <laughs> you cannot believe that it's, a, it's, it's real. It looks like a child lost its toy down there. But l go online and look up the googly-eyed squid, and, and, and you'll have to chuckle. Also, look at the when the baby s uh, sperm whale came down and paid us a visit uh, s several thousand feet under the ocean in the Gulf of Maine and just hung out with us. That was pretty wild. I actually just used um, the s footage from that googly eye squid for part of my Instagram takeover and did a few facts about sperm whales using that. So you can also go see that footage on our Instagram account under our stories. And the whale falls, those are amazing. Oh yes. When I whales fall to the ocean and, and then they're, they're uh, devoured, obviously a big, a big opportunity for other animals to come in and the amazing as, a, as they are eaten over time and then you see the ecosystem that evolves from them. Nothing goes to waste. Uh, there are so many wonderful clips to look at on our gallery and obviously we're collecting new ones right now. Dr. Ballard, in the chat, there's another question here for you saying that previously when you were on board, you guys collected a sponge encrusted in manganese when you were hoping to date it. Um, was there any insight or more information on that? Uh, oh, you came off SPL. Just me. Uh, yes, I mean, it's really hard to date some of them, but you can sort of get an estimate by the thickness of the manganese oxide. Now, I'm sure we're going to encounter some on this trip because we just did minutes ago on the summit of a much less impressive part of this volcano. There's a big summit we're going to be going to, uh, but it, you know, many of them could be uh, millions of years old. And we have a viewer asking what our depth is. Our depth is currently 1,417 meters. And they're asking, where are all the sea cucumbers? So. Well, that's the point. There's the, there is, other than sponges and corals that are uh, grabbing on to uh, a rock to be able to filter feed their nutrients out of the water column, 
you'll see you will not see crabs we haven't seen a crab a sea cumber or anything because this terrain is fundamentally uh, without nutrients because it's constantly on the move it doesn't have a, a, the base of a food chain here Uh, update we are still continuing on our uh, zero one zero bearing yeah. down slope yeah I think at some point uh, we can begin our ascent uh, I think we've been able to see the growth of these deposits and we've been at the other end where it's totally black so I have no problem if you want to begin uh, coming right and head for the summit it's always interesting. They're going to go up. We'll anyways. look at the contact with these flows with the bedrock as we exit out of this ravine. Uh, we're in the valley uh, of, of this uh, seamount. And so we'll begin our climb to the summit. And it's always an interesting trip as we move through different depth zones. So we're going to come around to uh, uh, to the south on a probably a bearing about what would you see uh, one one zero or something to that effect. It'll say, look at that rim on that rocks. Uh, we're always looking for something we've never seen, and some of the best people at recognizing that are our pilots. Uh, they're uh, somewhat forced to watch. <laughs> Others can walk away. The pilot doesn't walk away. But they have a corporate memory. Many of them have spent, uh, I would say, close to years under the ocean. And what, they're, what we're always asking them is, have you ever seen this before? And uh, many of our discoveries have been made by our pilots who said, I've never seen this. And they alert a senior scientist uh, to come in and take a peek. That's how Lost City was found on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, was the, was the operator said, I've never seen white towers of, uh, in a world of black. You want to look up something, look up Lost City. Bob, speaking of um, Rose Garden earlier, I saw Falcors there right now, and they found what we found uh, back in 2015, is that it was all paved over. With fresh lava. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, if you go running down the valley, there's a dead coral laying down looks like a fork mm -hmm. uh, yes if you go uh, uh, down the axis you'll get you'll find them and we had the same problem when we were there well, I think it was 2015 or 2015, something like that. Yeah. and the original vents that we discovered in 77 were completely covered because it's an area of constant active volcanism but we just went down axis and found the new ones so yeah. I'm sure they'll do the same it's a lot of ephemeral uh, activity happening down there and in fact, when we went there in 77, we did not see black smokers. But when we went down the axis in, in, in 15, 2015, we found active black smokers. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Now, you'll see those rocks with a little white spot. That's because as the flow goes by it, it doesn't deposit it. So downstream is where the white guy is pointing. And it's, like I say, it's, it's, it's just a servicial. Here, look at that little white spot. Or, on the rock to the right. That's because it flows around it. And in some cases, it's a pretty extreme white spot. But yeah, this is just constantly flowing down slope. I'm getting, waiting to see when we get out of the flow and get into contact with the bedrock, the host rock, which will be lava flows. Ship is moving, but I don't think Adelaine has felt that yet, so you might. Yeah. Uh, no, it'll uh, take us a while. I'll continue yeah, on with another step. Yeah. Uh, one, two, five. But we've sampled these flows both at the top and at the bottom. Uh, so we'll be able to do a nice analysis of their chemical content. Someone in the chat is asking, how fast is Hercules moving right now? Slower than a baby crawling <laughs> across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I like that analogy. <laughs> hey, babies can actually move pretty fast. Yeah, that's why I'm safe in saying <laughs> what I just said. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
It's it's slow. <laughs> we have to drag a cable. You have to remember that uh, you have two images you're getting. You're getting the image from Hercules, the close-up and personal one, and then you have the image coming in from it's uh, from Ad Atlanta. And Ad Atlanta's job is is to be directly under the ship, and it's we call it walking the dog. And so when you're walking the dog, you want to make sure you don't jerk on its chain. So the uh, the dance that goes on in the front row and up at the bridge is the navigator, the pilot of Hercules, the pilot of At Atlanta are all working in a synchronized way uh, where the scientists, like I just said, I want to, here's where I want to go. The navigator has to translate that into waypoints to the bridge, but then they start moving the ship and the game they typically play is try to get the ship ahead of, of the ROV. Uh, so that you're never pulling it. You'll see those that pulsing action. That's because uh, Ad Atlanta is connected directly to the ship on a vertical cable, uh, and that cable is causing the heaving action that goes on up and down, up and down. So fortunately, we have a. We tend to try to follow the uh, endless summer with our ship, but we still have the Pacific swell. So you'll see that cable going up and down. That's simply the rise and fall of our ship. But by having those swimming to spool floats, we call them footballs, they're really syntactic foam. And they have a loop in them so that they dampen out the motion. So you get the motion, and by, by the time it gets to Hercules, it stops moving and it doesn't really move Hercules. So that's the job, is walk the dog, and the dog never knows it's on a leash. Because when we sample, uh, we have to sit very carefully on the bottom and sample, and we don't want to be jerked around. And Simon, how heavy is that rope that Atalanta, or the cable that Atalanta has to drag behind it? So it does have some uh, some mass to it. The cable going from uh, Atalanta to Hercules also carries our uh, electrical power and our fiber optic uh, communications wires. And then that is surrounded then by a Kevlar rope to give it some strength and then a, an outer court for uh, insulation. So yeah, it probably a kilo or so per, per meter, per half meter. Um, but it's designed to be fairly buoyant in water, which is why we also have a, a weight in the middle uh, just to keep everything. So we get that nice S pattern that uh, Dr. Ballard was talking about and gives us um, some damping and protection from the sea swells. Are you able to send out the uh, image of the NORAD, the, uh, the sonar system we have? Uh, uh, that one, the, the, no, the, the, this one. Yeah, send that out to everyone because yep. what we're doing is we're creating a three-dimensional model of the terrain in which we're traveling. And so we'll put that on the satellite. We have so many. There we go. So here you see a little uh, icon of Hercules. It's traveling up slope, but it's, it's digitizing the terrain around it uh, as it goes. And then we'll be fusing that data set with the immersive camera systems. I think if you uh, yeah, send out the one that uh, shows all three cameras, see the up in the upper right, send that one out. We have two, so many things we could show you and sort of uh, we want to give you. So you'll see on here we have three different cameras on the, on the uh, vehicle right now that are stereo cameras. We have immersive cameras where we can create a three-dimensional image. So what we'll eventually do is to fuse the data set that's the optical data set with the acoustical data set to give you an immersive experience. Uh, we're going to be creating a tra actually traveling exhibits that will go all around the United States where we'll be showing you uh, this world that we're having. So uh, I know you'd love to be with us. Well, we're going to make it so you can be with us uh, by creating immersive experiences uh, from this day forward, these cameras will become uh, constantly on our vehicles, constantly uh, recording uh, all the expeditions we do in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, like I say, we'll be working uh, with museums and science centers and aquariums uh, 
not only around the United States, but around the world to create an experience that you just, you know, you'll feel like you're playing a video game. In fact, we're using the same video gaming technology to make that possible. Yeah, so just to jump on the way that Bob beautifully explained that is that the overall view of this um, expedition, Dan, you want to kind of give a recap of what is, we're not really, it's not necessarily looking for anything in particular, right? We're, test, we're doing the, testing our new video systems. Yeah, this is a new technology development cruise. So really, you know, a lot of stuff's going on. Um, they have the Norbits sonar system, which you just saw. So that's installed, and they're using that for pre-mapping. So that can see out like 100 meters. Um, and then that gives us the wide field of view, and they go down a map. And then they magically create these you know, high-resolution maps so we can then go and look at features. And then uh, essentially there's uh, uh, photogrammetry cameras. So three cameras that are high-resolution, high and we can take pictures of them. And the, as the, we go up, they take pictures, and we're able to create 3D models of the scenes. Which and we just printed one out. In fact, we do, if you like to you yes. know, take a look. So these 3D models allow us to take the flashlight that you're seeing now and look at 100 by 100 meters, or we went uh, one and a half kilometers up a slope, and we now have all that, all that one and a half kilometers you can see in one major picture. It allows you to really get a sense of how, what the scale is going on and put it all together. So it's like a puzzle piece. You take this puzzle and move it forward and you see the big picture at the very end. And then what we're able to do is from those three dimensional models, create one from a 3D printer. And this is the basalt columns that we first saw and we're able to see how many columns there are, how big they are, how the shape, shape they are, is there organisms growing them? And this one doesn't have it, but there were fish and we have high resolution three dimensional of a goose fish. <laughs> so those are the new technologies we're trying out here and at some point they will be standard uh, they will be standard you know practice for what we do. And oh. Jonathan do you want to kind of chime okay. on in on the models and so here's the model and what what do people why are we making models why are we putting out so much time and effort into this new technology to make models? Um, it's a new way to tell stories, and it's a new way to be situationally aware of uh, what's around or what we've explored. Um, and um, I'd say that as we go to some of these uh, unexplored uh, and uncharted places, um, I think we're always looking, the entire oceanographic community of explorers is looking for new ways to capture that for future generations to have a uh, record of what was seen and the data available to analyze and look at change. Um, that's what, in, for, for myself in particular, that um, the, the capacity to see change over time in a new way um, is incredibly exciting. We can make these 3D models and Let's pretend in uh, 10 years, uh, somebody wants to go back to that spot because they would like to compare how much how much did this spot change uh, in response to X, Y, Z, um, uh, any other activities uh, because of response to um, ocean temperatures, acidification, um, uh, climate change. Any of these questions are hard questions to measure if you don't have data. Um, I mean, even look at what we're, we're doing. We're actually um, a very rare event for our ship. Uh, we've returned to a couple of spots uh, where other exploration vessels, um, like the Pisces with, uh, 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 with Hurl at the University of Hawaii and the Okeanos Explorer have gone before and uh, we're able to review those initial grainy videos that were taken back in the 90s and, and make a comparison. And, and that's, that's really what we'd like to try to do. Um, with, with this project at the end, th these models. And one of the viewers uh, chimed in and says that, and I think these 3D printing of these models can allow blind people to also see the deep sea. And I think that's a great thing too. You're absolutely correct. Oh, that's awesome. That yeah. is awesome. You can feel it. You can like notice where there's a fish, where it's a coral. Yeah, you can go on a dive through the feeling and 
tactile that of it is all. so awesome yeah it does add a whole nother dimension to it i sure. really i really hope that that is very inspiring to hear in a, in a fantastic uh a fantastic comment from from that viewer uh i i would i and the rest of ocean exploration trust and everyone here in the control van are always looking for new ways to connect uh other people with with the work that we do and and it's comments like that or insights like that that i didn't necessarily think of yeah. um uh, but it, it drives us to do things like we're trying to do now, which is um, we're just downstairs right now. Um, we're creating these virtual realities. I, I have the computer up right in front of me at the Triclops NAS downstairs. We're running reality capture. Um, I'm hoping to achieve, although, you know, this is, this is a, a bit of a stretch goal, but for this project, uh, I hope to achieve that we can uh, create a virtual reality, create a model, and have it up on Sketchfab for you to print at home. Uh, within uh, let's 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 pick an arbitrary number of uh, three hours to start. Within three hours of seeing something, three hours of recording it with with the triclops, the wide field camera array, uh, processing it. Can we get that up on Sketchfab for viewers at home to either print or to view in Sketchfab's awesome three D viewer app? or to create their own art around that 3D representation, like that, that, that is the goal uh, that's closest to us and I think achievable. Mike, question for you on um, the chat here. Under what surface conditions do you abort or postpone a dive? Surface conditions, yeah. Um, so, a lot of what we're kind of limited by is um, the ship's dynamic sh ship's dynamic positioning system. Um, <laughs> so we have um, a bow thruster and a jet pump in the aft of the ship, and kind of what makes this possible is we're able to hold the ship. The ship can hold station, um, so we can then, um, as we were talking about earlier, kind of dangle that wire that's holding Atalanta in a place that is safe, so we're not going to bounce it against cliffs or anything like that. Um, so the sea states at the top um, are kind of limited by that. So not only is it forces of swell or waves, the, um, the wind and the current, but also the vectors that all three of those are interacting with each other and um, how much of that is a beam of the ship or how much we can face into um, at any given moment. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a little bit of an equation. Um, I'd say we definitely don't go in um, if we've got uh, seas over two and a half meters. Uh, we don't go in if, if our winds are above um, 25 knots. And um, currents uh, usually is, is uh, depending on those other forces, how much current we can withstand as well. Uh, just checking in, Jonathan, in the back row. Um, so now that we're kind of out of that uh, valley and heading up slope here, uh, working more on the, f uh, the blocky photogrammetry stuff, just let us know if, um, if there's a distance, if you want us to be farther away to image or closer up, um, and kind of what, uh, what, if you want us to w wag more or, or stay straight, just let us know uh, direction, um, any direction back there so we can uh, make a better model for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say um, the objective is to find an area of dense coral diversity, coral sponge diversity that has a, a mixture of terrains um, for, to do the gridded survey. Okay. Um, we'd like to do at least one gridded survey that will take X amount of time, um, which which others should should chime in on and, and for the planning purposes. Um, so my request would be to head up the mountain as quickly as possible, um, as low as possible from the ROV's perspective uh, to get good color out of the cameras. Um, I'm gonna start the photogrammetry now. And uh, if we can maintain that kind of steady pace until we see something, I'd love to try to see if we can get to the base of this mountain to the top with a single unified model. So Jonathan, you talked about having Hercules be as low to the bottom um, to get the best image. Simon, what is our height from the bottom? Where's uh, Hercules sitting at depth-wise? So if um, right at the back of the 
submersible we have the um, what we call the Doppler velocity logger which is uh, sends out four beams onto the seabed and gives us a relative velocity of those four beams we also use those as uh, an altimeter going up slope here it's a little tricky to tell when we're going up and down slope that because it's the uh, position of that sensor at the back of the sub it says we're a lot higher off the seabed than we are uh, the front of the sub can be very close and the depending on the uh, the angle of the slope and the topography it can be a a little higher so we're reading at the moment three and a half meters but I would I would say the front of the ROV is definitely less than that so, so it's a lot of um, looking at our images we got a good image from uh, Atalanta to see uh, how the terrain is going and uh, you know we can look sideways on the slope here and we can see there's it's quite a steep hill that we're climbing up so the back of the sub is telling me I'm three meters off bottom uh, however, my eyes and everything else at the front is telling me it's probably closer to uh, one and a half to two meters. So uh, would you say that a lot of it is part of being an ROV pilot is just your experience, right? You can't completely rely just on your equipment and what it's saying to you, but also it seems like your intuition and everything you're putting together. It is, yeah, part of it is experience. Um, we learn, you know, at any time one of those instruments could fail and we'd have to uh, go without it. So. We use, definitely use them a lot to uh, tell us where we are, but there are certain instances such as going up and down slope where we have to use a little bit more intuition and look at the color on the camera and try and gauge size of objects on the seabed so we can you know, see from experience how high we think we are. And, uh, and again, fortunate that we got the view from Atla Atalanta. That's not a, a usual thing for ROVs. Normally we, uh, we're isolated and we don't get a, you know, an uh, overview uh, looking down at us, um, so it's that's quite a luxury to have. So, yeah. And it also is just a really cool shot. I love the Atalanta video image showing Herc doing its thing there. It is. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, as I say, it's not an image we, uh, as ROV pilots on different uh, different ROVs and different vessels that we get, unless we do multiple ROV operations, uh, where we have one ROV looking down. And making sure that we're uh, safe going into structures and, and certain areas. So, on occasion, we do. Uh, Mike, you're a little low there. We got mm -hmm. some terrain. Uh, yeah. Here. yeah All right, Zach, I'm going to um, start doing the multiple vehicle operations. Now. The most I've been involved with, we've had five ROVs in the water at one time. Oh, wow. Five. Yeah. How do, is it, got it? Is it difficult right. to make sure those ROVs don't run into each other? It takes a, yeah, it takes a lot of coordination, and we had that's for a. Uh, an inspection of a of an oil rig, the the metal uh, support structure that uh, goes onto the seabed, and uh, basically we operate then at different elevations on that structure. So we'll have uh, ROVs maybe working at 20 meters, another one at 50, another one at 100, 150, 200 meters, say for example, and uh, we try and coordinate it that way. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, always a mission, and even in construction, we use generally use two ROVs for uh, construction operations and uh, you know it's always a ensure that we keep our tethers well away from each other and coordinate our movements so that we don't get entangled it's uh, adds an extra dimension to it and then Jonathan here's another comment for you as a suggestion as head of our media um, Another way to make some of your content accessible to blind people is to take a leaf from NASA's book with regard to some of the web telescope images. You could describe what is being shown in some of your clips in your gallery. So I know a lot of our gallery also has blogs that kind of explain stuff, but I guess it doesn't necessarily describe the images. Yeah, I'll tell you what, um, you know, we've discussed this uh, internally. We, I mean, like, like, like absolutely seriously discussed um, how to improve our, the accessibility of all of our media. And I'll say if you, if you are listening and um, uh, you genuinely are, uh, have input um, as uh, navigating through our website and our other content resources, um, uh, as, as a visually impaired person, I would really encourage you, you can reach out to us at uh, education at nautiluslive.org. Um, uh, I'm sorry, education at oceanexplorationtrust.org. Um, 
and uh, would love to hear your thoughts on what elements are or are not accessible. That, that includes for anyone else that has is neurodivergent or has other disabilities. Uh, we're always looking for ways or tools or other websites that really do it right um, in terms of making content accessible. Um, as far as YouTube and um, some of our other galleries, uh, that really does give me a good, a good, a good thought. Um, it would be fantastic to actually create a more narrated view of some of our, our top highlight clips um, to be able to to really share that joy um, with the world. So thank thank you so much for that comment. They said that they love the transcript on the archive dives, but they're saddened that they can't use auto captions on the live feed. Transcript on the auto drive to drive. Oh, does auto captions not work on live? Hmm. I think you, uh, viewer, have given Jonathan something to look into. Well, I am. I am totally open. Open for for genuine good feedback like this for 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 all of our live streams it's not something that we typically think about right and and um and we should and we we try we try our absolute best um but having direct experience like this is is really really fantastic observations like this i'm actually going right now on our youtube and checking this out for the live stream We saw a little bit of corals there and some sponges on that last little boulder there. I'm really hoping that as we continue up this mountain or the seamount, we're going to see a lot more coral. Yeah. Be like, be like last night where we took the survey. Yeah, well, I think it seems to be kind of the trend, right, on sea mounds. We kind of had this similar topography earlier, and then at the top where you have the highest amount of nutrients being pushed up by the upwelling, you have those currents. Um, it allows that um, bigger biodiversity. Yeah, no, I agree. Plus, it seems like the substrate's maybe a little hardier, too, for it to it latch onto. What I thought was just tremendous was when we did the survey last night, they were able to put that all together and have a 3D scene downstairs. Yeah. So Zach, you come from more of a coral background, but on this trip you've kind of been put into almost like a programming spot and having to create these data models. Do you think you could kind of give feedback to anyone who's not done this before, but maybe wants to try to start doing it? Uh, yeah. I mean, the first thing I would say, just just try it. Um, it's, a lot of these programs and um, systems can be pretty intimidating. Um, there's also many different programs you can use. Um, but honestly, it's what I have found with a lot of uh, programs I've had to learn throughout my science, um, whether it's for statistics or um, modeling like we're doing now, um, there's a steep learning curve in the beginning, and you just got to get through that. Um, usually lasts a couple weeks, depending on how much you're doing it, but um, you got to get through that steep learning curve, and then it, and it's much easier. Um, things make a lot more sense. You start to understand why you're doing what you're doing. You're not just, you know, this is what one book told you to do, but now you have a different scenario. So, um, yeah, uh, myself and... Um, we've got a solid team downstairs. Uh, it's not just yeah. one of us. All of us are putting in hours constantly to to uh, get these photos through and off the camera as fast as possible and then getting that final result. So it's really rewarding. Um, it's cool to see. Um, like, we, like we were showing the model before, having that printed out within a couple of days of being there, um, that's, pr that's pretty cool. Um, but I, I'm a little partial. I enjoy using technology with science as well. So these are the things that I'm gladly willing to learn. And I think that's part, you said earlier that you were making models of our current dive. So yeah. it's like you can't, I feel like it used to be, it would take a long time to create these models and now we're almost able to do them real yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the work with photogrammetry is just the back end. <laughs> Getting the pictures obviously is huge. And for us, we're really lucky here to have um, these pilots who can, who can uh, 
get the get Hercules to cooperate and get uh, the photos we're looking for, because um, that's the other thing. If if you have if you don't have good photos coming in, you can't do much. So we're very appreciative of having these photos coming in that we have plenty to work with. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty rewarding to be able to get through the whole process in just a couple days now. But I think everybody on this ship is is a big part of that. Um, whether it's the people who set up the video so we can even see it, the people who set up the programming, the people steering. Um, us down the lab, we kind of have the, the fun final touch of the job. So, yeah. And then Mike and Simon, I feel like everyone thinks ROV pilots, your main job is flying the ROV, but I feel like that's actually a small part of your complete job. Can you talk about the other duties that you have besides flying Hercules and Atalanta? Yeah, so obviously we, as well as flying the ROV, we have to maintain it, fix it, uh, keep it ready for flying. Um, we, particularly in the science with ROVs, we're looking at innovations and how we can improve things. And a lot of the guys here that are working on this ROV are doing a lot of design work as well. And um, But yeah, we, we operate to maintain launch systems. The whole kit is uh, sometimes even right down to the video suites and other scientific instruments on board. We get involved with uh, operating those as well and uh, occasionally providing video commentary and video editing and yeah, networking, all sorts of, it's a really wide ranging uh, set of skills that an ROV pilot has to have as well as being able to fly. It sometimes feels flying is the, is the least of what we have to do. Um, but yeah, we have to work with the, the high voltage electricity, the electronics, the hydraulics the mechanical side of things, the computer, the networking, the fiber optic side of things. So yeah, we need a quite a broad range of of skills and knowledge to be ROV. Yep. So for the students that might be listening at home and they're entering their robotics competition and going to build their first ROV, do you have any advice for them? Keep it simple. Don't try and overcomplicate it. Um, Pick a task that you want your ROV to do, and and uh, yeah, make sure it can it can complete that task. Sometimes we can get uh, overcomplicated in the way we go about things and uh, things. So we have a you know keep it simple and keep it functional and easy to operate. <laughs> you can see here on this on these rocks, you're seeing these kind of massive stalks. Um, or what once was kind of a holdfast or peduncle, or I think it's holdfast for what appears to be maybe sponges, uh, possibly corals that were once here and no longer are. It's kind of interesting to see yeah. Yeah. over time that they've, they haven't been able to survive here. You can kind of see some of them at the bottom. There's one there top left. Uh, coral that kind of or sponge it just went down like right. fell off yeah right on the left right there Zach do you have an idea what kind of sponge that might be has that um, long that stalk to it almost um, I missed it I was right in the previous one so um, some of those stalked sponges have a big kind of a bigger top that yeah. we're not really seeing them. I'm suspecting that they fly away and the stalks remain. But. Yeah. And a lot of these sponges and anemones are... We have uh, another sponge coming up here. Very similar from a distance especially. Oh well, yeah, you saw it first in the triclops in the oh. lenses. That's a sponge. Oh, what are you? This looks like it will be, it's called a Semperella species. Um, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty easy one to notice there. Looks rock hard almost. So sponges are simplest animal. Um, they kind of evolutionary first, I think. Uh, you have what's the kind of a bigger main hole, which is called the osculum. And the phylum name is Porifera, which means pore bearing. So you have a lot of these pores that water goes in, and you have these little cilia that beat and creates this water flow. So
So they mm. filter the water out of plankton as it goes in, and plankton and detritus, and that's how they feed, is just by whipping the hair back and forth. Does anyone have a favorite type of sponge? I like the loofah. <laughs> you like the loofah? <laughs> I'm a Brillo man myself. I think a SpongeBob. SpongeBob. <laughs> oh, a little dogfish, is it? Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. Have, I, have I cut uh, a uh, highlight video one. that mentioned SpongeBob? <laughs> So yeah, Danny, and in, just in addition to your uh, question about what an RV guy needs to know, we also have to uh, assess what is interesting to look at and what is not sometimes. And uh, yeah, for biology, you know, kind of recognizing things, but also for uh, all the other engineering stuff that we look at, we have to have a knowledge of what we're looking at as well from geological, biological, engineering perspectives as well. So you have to have a keen eye. <laughs> as Dr. Ballard said, you know, we've down here forced to watch for a, <laughs> a long time a video and sometimes as he says it's like I've never seen that before and, yeah. pretty cool yeah down on these depths we have potential to see some glass sponges too which um, are pretty unique very different from your typical calcareous sponge yeah they're, they're actually made of silica instead of um, the, the calcium um, carbon area so those ones are really interesting. Um, they look like, if you put them under a microscope especially, you can see all the little spicules and see how it binds and holds itself together. Uh, basically, it looks like a bunch of little hairs that are all tied up. Can you explain for our viewers what a spicule is? Yeah, so it's like, it's it's literally makes up the body of the glass sponge, essentially. Hey. It's kind of its its structure and holds it together. Um, but yeah, and, and again, it's, it's made of silica, which is the same as glass, right? Hence the name glass sponge. They aren't actually glass. They're more like fiberglass. Um, if you were ever like touch a dead one, like yeah. in a lab, and stuff, you always see every once in a while in labs people have glass sponges, but they always encourage you to not touch with bare skin because you will be itchy <laughs> for quite a while after. So, which is exactly yeah. how it feels like if you touch fiberglass. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So the sponges, if you ever buy natural sponges, they actually have to scrape them to get rid of the spicules mm, yeah. beforehand. It's already dinner time. Wow. Time's just flying by when you're under the ocean <laughs> having fun. Anything else on the chat? Yeah, we have Victoria, or Veronica, sorry. Veronica is saying that her favorite sponge is a, oh man, I'm going to butcher this. <laughs> oh. Claydor Heizid. Heiz? Yeah, sorry. I'm terrible with my scientific <laughs> name pronunciation. I have to hear it. I'm not very good at reading it. But, Zach, maybe you can pronounce it better for us. It's spelled C L A D O R I H I Z I D. No, never. It's a new one. Oh. Oh, I Ooh. can see why it's their favorite, though. Yeah. Ooh. Can you describe uh, what it looks like for us? Um, no, I don't know how to describe that. That is... Oh, there it says they're carnivorous, though, which is quite intense for a sponge. I think we've been seeing um, a few of these hemichoraliums and a couple plur pluricoraliums. Uh, coral just pointing out stuff in front of us here. The red one there? Um, on the right, the white was the hemichoralium, I think. And then that red looks like a basket star on top of something, but I could be mistaken. Oh, uh, yeah. Crinoid, and then, oh, is that a bubble going?